Hey friends, welcome back to Storytime with Chantastic, where we talk about the craft of front end development. Super excited today because uh, we're talking about storybook and monorepos with Katarina Scrumpello. I hope that I got that cl close. Okay, cool. Yeah, I got a thumbs yeah, up. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It is a pleasure to have you on the show today, Katarina. Uh, thank you so much for being here. For those who don't know you already, would you mind just telling us a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do? Sure, of course. First of all, thanks for inviting me and thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Katarina Skrumpeli. I'm from Greece. I'm a senior software engineer at Narwhal and I'm in the core team of NX. And yeah, a few things more. I, I'm also a Google developer expert for Angular Web Technologies and the Google cool. Maps platform. And I think I recently uh, became a Woman Tech Makers Ambassador for Google. So yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I I think I think, but I, I'm on the <laughs> I mean I'm in the process still. Maybe. In the process. <laughs> in any case, yeah. I I also advocate for women in tech. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that. How was that process? Did they reach out to you yeah. or was there a yeah. application? Oh, they cool, reached cool. out to me because I, I do all this, this sort of women mentoring things with either with Tracy Lee or on some other things on my own. So, yeah. That's awesome. I love that. I, I love something that I really love about technology this field right now that it's rapidly growing is is that there there seems to be an infinite amount of space for kind of like your interests your your patterns like the groups that you find to just participate in that and then kind of find these really cool avenues along the way like you know google like finding those relationships and being able to connect in that way <laughs> yeah it's it's true it's true <laughs> well today we're talking about one of my favorite topics just because it's so, um, I think, difficult to understand and maybe misunderstood. And so I, we, I was looking around thinking, who could we talk with about monorepos? And you have some just incredible, incredible work online specifically talking about storybook and monorepos and design systems and component libraries and all that. And so I was like, we got to get Katarina on the show. So thank <laughs> you for joining us. Um, I have, so I think first and foremost, um, in your own words, how would you describe a monorepo? Like, what is a monorepo? Um, I will I will use my own words firstly, but then I'm going to to quote some parts of an article by B Victor Safkin, which I think it's cool. It, it's the the most valuable thing I've read on monorepos so far, and I'm not saying that because uh, Victor is uh, is the founder of Narwhal, right? <laughs> I'm saying that, that <laughs> it was. I read it before joining. It was the first article I read on monorepos, and I found it very helpful. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. In my in the simple words I'm going to use, a monorepo is like a repository where you you do collocate code, but it's not the collocation that is important. the The thing that makes it a monorepo in my head is that you sort of have different projects that de depend on each other and share code. So they also share dependencies and uh, when you build something or you test something, things are affected throughout the repository. So that's in my mind, that is how the monorepo is. <laughs> Interesting. Um, okay, cool, cool. So it's, it's multiple, it's multiple projects, but then the goal is not so much the fact that they're co-located into one place, but that they can interdepend on each other and that those when something changes, everything adjusts. Yeah. So okay, I, cool, I want cool. to read a small part from from Victor's article. I'm I'm going to send you the link that maybe you can post. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> that uh, I like the the fact that that Victor clears up a misconception that monorepo is not a monolith, a monolith like a monolithic repository because that that's that's a great misconception when someone wor works on a monorepo, right? That they have. Uh, like a big repository and you have all the different applications that the team is that multiple teams are working on so why have a single repository if you're just going to just dump in there all the different <laughs> applications right so sure, yep. so yeah that's a misconception and that's not it um victor says here that uh monorepo is not a monolith quite the contrary 
uh, monorepos simplify code sharing and cross project refactorings, and they significantly lower the cost of creating libraries, microservices, and micro frontends. Adopting a monorepo often enables more deployment flexibility. So from what I read here, we understand that the goal behind, um, behind deciding to go with a, uh, a monorepo architecture is that you actually intend to, to share code between different, uh, different projects and to also make sure that, um, that you, use, uh, you use a different architectural mindset like for creating libraries or microservices or even micro front ends. So let's give a small example of what um, of what you could do in a monorepo. Like you have a say you have a front end application and written, I don't know, in in React it doesn't even it doesn't really matter. Sure. And you have a small uh, you have to build a small API with Express, right? And you have some interfaces or some classes. Uh, and so you're using TypeScript and you want everything typed and you want to, to make sure that the interface that you have, you can share it. So you can use this class or this interface both in the API application, in the Express server, for example, and both in the front facing React application. So you just build a shared library, you store in there the interfaces or the classes and you import this in both of these so that you don't have to duplicate, for example, the code of that. Sure. That's an example. Or another example would be that you you're building a an online shop, right? And you want an application that is for admins, and you want an application that is for the customers. And these two applications, of course, they want to share some elements, some buttons, for example, or some common design elements that we're going to get into in the design systems, like <laughs> the buttons, the headers, the links, or how things look like. You don't want to build these things twice. You don't want to, to duplicate the styles both in one application and the other. So you create the shared library and you have these two other libraries or applications inside the same monorepo and you share the code from the shared library. You will say here, but I can do that without a monorepo because I can actually create this shared library and publish it and then import it from there. Well, the monorepo makes things a bit easier because you would not have to do the extra step of publishing the library and then importing it elsewhere. You can do all the imports from within and then decide which things you want to build and which things you want to publish. So it sort of Interesting. simplifies the process. Yeah. So if, if I understand correctly from, from what you're saying is that if we, one of the, ben, the, the primary benefits that you're describing of a mono repo is that if you, if every team kind of works on their own, and they do their own thing, uh, the interface for sharing that code is going to be some type of published step, whether that's publicly published or published to some type of private yeah. you know, uh, Internal, package manager yeah. or something like that. Um, but that step is effectively a hard requirement in order to be able to share that. However, with a mono repo, you can choose, or you, you can still share code because it's all in the same code base, um, but then you can kind of choose whether or not or when to publish certain packages or keep them private just to the monorepo code. And base. it's more flexible. For example, you can have, I mean, I hope I'm not saying something wrong now, but for example, for, for the <laughs> client I have now, we have this shared, this, uh, this shared library, which has shared components. And say you want to, to publish a new version of that application, which uses some of the shared components. Because in the shared application, I'm just importing this part. I, I will only uh, publish a new version of the application and I will not have to republish the, the shared library, for example, you know, because it's going to yeah. be in the same repository, you will import it and it's going to be added in the new build and you don't want to worry about it, for example. Yeah, this is really interesting because I think that this is something that is, and, and I'm so glad that I asked you because I think that this is something that a lot of people do have a misconception about. I totally agree with that, where we think so much about a mono repo being about co-location. Like co-location seems to be like the, like the it word, like what can we jam together? Yeah. But this is really <laughs> more about how difficult uh, versioning and sharing is and 
if you don't have to introduce that publish step for everything, but you still want to keep parts of your application stack separated um, instead of having that monolithic kind of like top to bottom, all the code is in one like package, I guess, um, you're able to do that with a monorepo. And you, you can release another misconception is that you have to release all at once. For example, you have to release together all the, the bundles or the packages. That's not true. You can do separate releases and yeah, you don't have to release everything all together, for example, or, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious now, it seems like monorepos over the last like five-ish years maybe have become a really... Uh, I guess like an exciting architecture, like a lot of people are really interested in, in this right now. I'm curious, um, why do you think that is? Like, is, is it because of the way that we're building apps now versus the way that we were in the past or well, is there some other reason? Mm, so if you asked me four years ago, I didn't even know what monorepos were, right? To be honest. <laughs> um, and I'm sure other people knew, but you know, I think lately it's, uh, I think it's mostly two things lately. I think there are more tools that support monorepos and enable monorepo development and make it easier. Um, so I think that's one part. The other part I think is that, for example, when I started web development, I think back in Okay, I will not talk about the simple web pages I was building in school, right? <laughs> sure, when, sure. when I started <laughs> actual web development in 2014, I guess, uh, we, we already had some, some pretty sophisticated tools. So it was not just jQuery, it was uh, Angular 1. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. still, since then, lots and lots more tools have started to be added. And also, uh, the way to, to write uh, JavaScript APIs or TypeScript-based APIs has uh, has been enhanced and more tools are jumping on board. So I think that mm -hmm. now there is maybe more need to share code between front-end and back-end, for example, I want to say. And maybe because it, the tools uh, that enable monitor development are more and more widespread, uh maybe it's also that that uh that makes people not be afraid to adopt a monorepo architecture to to add more tools to i don't know i guess interesting yeah yeah so that is kind of maybe going back to like the the benefit of and correct me if i'm saying this wrong but like it sounds like that's kind of more of the co-location benefit where when all this codes in the same place we can use uh, uh, we can use a certain set of tools across the whole, the whole, like all of the packages in the mono repo. Um, and so then that allows us to do like some setup maybe once instead of across all of our packages every time. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And now um, that you said that I'm going to, to make a small reference to now that you said about one setup for all the packages yeah. if you if you go into our github and you take a look at the nx15 roadmap so nx we're going to talk more about nx of course but uh one of the things that nx does is that it wants to remove from the developer um the the tiring task of writing configurations, of writing manually things <laughs> yeah. that can be automated, of of you know of the of the hard labor or the the tiring tasks that someone has to do in any case, and just remove all this uh, this burden from the developer and just let the developer do the the developing, the actual engineering, yeah. you know. So <laughs> yeah, uh, one of our new Mm, aspirations for an X15, for example, the roadmap was published uh, a month ago, is a negative configuration. Like not on, so until now, an X removes configuration. And we said we, in an X14, our huge thing was zero configuration, that we remove the configurations that you have to write. In an X15, as you said, uh, we are targeting for negative configuration, which means that, as you said, you have a lot of settings or a lot of things or a lot of scripts that are the same across all projects. 
So NX will understand that and it will remove lots of lines of code that are the same for each project and just actually oh, wow. go negative on your configuration. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> That is so fascinating. <laughs> I love how we're, we, we went from like, you know, like the Webpack era, which was like just wild amounts of configuration and Babel and all that kind of stuff coming together. And then everything became like zero config. And now we're like pushing for negative, negative config. Get, yeah. uh, get... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So that actually brings up, um, I, I think right before we go into N NX, um, that kind of like brings up uh, this the kind of like bridge question of like, what are some of the challenges that we face when we try to adopt a mono repo? Because, you know, obviously nothing is without cost or complication. Uh, what are some of the things that are difficult if you were to do it with like effectively without some of the tooling that you'd mentioned is kind of making it easier? Say, for example, that for me, going from a non mono repo mindset to a mono repo mindset, and that happened when I joined Narwhal, for example, because I had not worked in an actual mono repo before I joined Narwhal, it was to, to understand the mindset. And the, by the mindset, I mean, um, when do I create an application? When do I create a library? Why do I need to share code? Why do I need to import things there? Why do I care about dependencies? So that was the, the mm -hmm. first thing, the, the philosophy and the mindset of why someone would, would want someone or evil, right? And <laughs> then, so NX helps you get into that mindset by being quite opinionated on, it, on its architecture. Of course, it's very configurable and it's very easy for you to configure work, your workspace however you want. However, it does provide lots of generate code generators and code scaffolding tools that impose an architecture for you and make it very easy for you to, to jump right into the, the philosophy that NX explains in its documentation. Because if you go into the NX documentation, the first intro to NX, in the intro to NX page, uh, the first title, the first paragraph is philosophy. And it explains the philosophy behind the next. And the next paragraph is the mental model, right? Which explains the mental model to how to, to go about developing an X, right? So first you have to go into the mindset. <laughs> and luckily we have code generators that, that spit out code that helps you get into the mindset quickly. Nice. So yeah, one of my favorite things about an X was, uh, and is, is the code generators. So you have plugins and that uh, generate applications, generate libraries, generate code, generate tests for you. Um, Interesting. So, yeah, generate configurations for you. So this is very, very helpful. However, an X is, th the main goal of an X is not that. So you can use an X without all of this. You can use an X without generators. And the, the core uh, value behind an X is that it helps with monorepo development in the sense that it takes care of your builds and it takes care of how your dependencies are managed and it takes care of how your artifacts are cached. So it sort of takes care of all the things that are, are hard to take care for in a monorepo to make, you, to make sure that your pipelines are not long because you have a thousand projects in one single repository and it makes sure that there is not like a dependency spaghetti thing that uh, that messes up everything. In an X, of course, you have you have a workspace and you have your applications and libraries, and you also have lots of metadata. The metadata uh, define the projects and what the projects are. Is it an application? Is it a library? Is it buildable? Is it not? Also, you define boundaries. Uh, so that you don't end up with a spaghetti dependency thing. So <laughs> this this project can only import these types of projects. You can tag your projects, for example, and protect uh, and and protect the dependencies in between them. Um, and then when you when you reach to the part where you want to to build and publish your code, NX ha does uh, uh, analyzes your code. Uh, analyzes your dependencies. It produces a dependency graph, which shows how everything is connected. And what it does is 
it checks out and understand which parts of the code were affected by a change that you made. So if I have a library that is called a header and the header is imported in, in two applications, the, the client and the admin, if I change the color of the header, these two applications are going to be affected. The button library is not going to be affected. So when you rebuild or retest or redo a task that is added in the NX, pipe, uh, in the NX ecosystem, then the task will only be rerun for these projects that were actually affected. Interesting. So yeah, you can understand that this saves much, much time from pipelines. That's that's really interesting because it kind of one of the thing like one of the values maybe of versioning, you know, if you do go through that step of, you know, publishing each of the packages individually, is is that you kind of have this handmade contract through the versioning, right? Of you know, like, oh, well, we changed, we know that we changed this. And so if you want to update, you have to, you know, we're going to say that it's this version, meaning it's this kind of update, there's a breaking change or whatnot. And so then if you want to update, you'll have to do this. But it sounds like in a kind of like mono repo type of setup, you might not have that by default, you would have to, I mean, just like, if you were building a monolithic application, not really know specifically what changed. Um, but this is kind of like, it sounds like NX is kind of providing like this middle ground where it's like, hey, we know that you imported that thing and that has a change in it now. And so you need to update this yeah. in order to like actually get everything working together. When you rerun a, a command, the way it understands whether that command has been run again is that it hashes together uh, multiple things. It takes into account multiple things. It takes into account, for example, the relevant source code, right? That this line is changed in this file and this was imported by that, etc. But also it takes into account the command that you run because you might have run a build for, uh, for production or you might have run a build with specific configurations. So it, it adds that into the, the hash as well. Also it adds the node version and other parts of your configuration that may be relevant to the task that you run. So the way that it computes the affected and, and the hash that will store is that it takes into account all the various things from your environment, it creates a hash, and then whenever you, you try to run a command, it will check if that hash exists, for example. So the other thing that speeds up the, the pipeline is the caching that NX provides. So uh, first, it will only rebuild the parts of the code that are affected. But also what it will do is that an actual provide caching, which means that whenever you run a command, uh, NX produces an artifact of the, of the result of that command. And if you run a build, for example, it will create the build artifacts and it will also store the, uh, the command output and whatever, if it, mm. if it had errors or not, or any output the command had. And this will be stored somewhere locally if you're not using an cloud for example and the great thing about that is if you try to rerun that command it will look into its cache and it will fetch the results from the cache so that also saves nice. much much time so if you're using the affected and also you're using the cache you see that you save much time because first you're not building everything and also the things that you have already built are fetched from the cache and how the caching works is that uh, whenever you run a command, NX stores um, the whole environment that you run your command with. So, for example, it will first um, it will first, of course, store the the build artifacts, but it will also store um, the the command that you run with any flags that you added or any options, like if you build for production or not, it will also store the node version or other or any other things that you, you may have used in order to configure that command. And all this will be uh, all this will be added in a hash. A hash will create will be created from all this information and this will be stored and this will be checked against whenever you run a command to see if it's uh, if it's cached or not. Interesting. So it sounds like you have a lot of guarantee, like when you're using something like NX, it's doing a lot to ensure that you don't commit something without knowing the effects of it. 
um, but then also ensures that your development environment stays pretty snappy while you're making these changes and kind of knowing like when to kind of, you know, bust a cache and when to just kind of deliver the last version of that thing. Yep. And uh, we can see how that before we talked about monorepos, now we can see that with these tools, monorepo development does not sound that scary after all, you know, because if you if you have all these things that make sure that whatever you do is fast and efficient and you have code generators, then it, it even sounds better, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think that's one of the things that, you know, scary is like very much the right word for it, right? Because I think that that is one of the things that's really hard in making that leap is not understanding exactly how to bring all these tools um, together and how to actually like optimize them. Because I know I've I, like, I've made some fairly naive mono repos in the past where I just kind of like start putting packages into the same uh, repo. And it quickly becomes, like you said, that like spaghetti dependencies where it's like this thing depends on that. And I don't really know how to check to make sure that if this thing changed, like that thing knows about it and all that. And add versioning to that and just gets like chaotic. Um, but it sounds like a lot of that is really handled for you if you start if you use something like NX, like all of the kind of like hard work of actually integrating those pieces and making sure that they communicate to each other and aren't just like directories inside of a repo. Um, that that is really the magic of using something like NX. Indeed. That's true. <laughs> well, I'd love to shift gears a little bit and talk about the integration between uh, Storybook and NX and kind of how this all works together specifically for people who are building design systems or managing component libraries and whatnot. And uh, you are managing that integration. Is that correct? Right now, yes. So before it was uh, other people. Um, so I think Isaac from the NX team built it three years ago and then yuri was in charge of it and now yuri mostly does the i think he's like the, the devil manager in narwhal so i sort of took over the the story with integration <laughs> and i'm very happy for it <laughs> I'm, i was stepping on the shoulders of giants as they say <laughs> so yeah when i joined narwhal two years ago i yeah yuri yuri suggested that i help out with the with the storybook plugin and a plugin for an X is a set of generators and executors and scripts and integrations and wrappers around uh, other tools to bring the other tools into the NX ecosystem and make an X uh, and make it easy to manage them through an X and also add them in the whole caching and affected and the whole things I described before. So um, the main thing with, uh, the, with the Storybook plugin is that uh, we try to, to be, first we try to, to be on top of the newest versions of Storybook, uh, but you can use Storybook in an X like you would use Storybook in any other application that does not use an X. The added value that uh, an X provides is that we generate stories so we we have uh, we have scripts which we call generators that read the components either in React or in Angular and they understand the props or the inputs and they write stories for you which have the the controls like the arguments that you pass. So that's one of my favorite things. The other thing is that it generates storybook configuration, right? So it configures uh, your application or your library to work with Storybook, like it generates the dot .storybook directory and the main JS and the preview JS and whatever else you may need in the TS config. So that's another thing that it does. And the other thing that it does is that you can, you can now run Storybook through an X using an NX command. So instead of doing yarn start Storybook that you would do in like a pure React Storybook mm -hmm. or Angular Storybook application, you would do NX Storybook and the name of the application or the library, and it will start up the Storybook server. But it will start up the Storybook server through our wrapper that's a, a, like a function that is wrapped around it. And the, the good thing about that would be that it would store all the artifacts 
in VNX cache, for example. And it would also ask your application and your changes in the affected uh, whole system, the code base analysis. So that, that's what the, that's the main thing that the Sorbook plugin does. But what is more, and this is also one, another favorite thing of mine, is that we provide migration scripts. So what does oh, that wow. mean? That when you move from one version to the other, MX will actually change your files and the formats to match the new schema, right? It will also update your packages, but it will also, for example, when the, when the story syntax changed for Angular, we did a migration that, that changed the syntax, like it moved the component around, the, the, the component uh, argument around, for example. Or I think there is another migration, no, I think <laughs> there is another migration that, uh, that will sort of migrate the, the workspace from Storybook 5 to Storybook 6, and it will just generate new configurations for all the libraries. That is not that is not a very opinionated, of course, migrator because it would be a challenge to do that. But uh, sure. still, it sort of removes some manual code that you need to write. Um, also, for example, let me look. Also, for example, um, now that there was this big change in uh, in Angular thirteen point one, and lots of projects broke because it needed Angular was looking for the default project and it could not read some styles with the style preprocessor options. Again, we wrote a migrator for that that would go around in the, into the configuration files and set the browser target specifically. So the cool thing about using Storybook with an X is that it automates some tasks and it removes the need for you to do manual labor that you would need to do like a braiding from one version to the other, doing some menial tasks like moving some things around, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like, <laughs> honestly, it sounds like if you use NX with the uh, Storybook integration, it, it's almost like you're getting a Storybook expert on your team because you're getting basically all of your experience managing these things and running the migrations from different versions and making sure that the stories are generated properly with the right interface controls and all of that stuff. You're getting all of that uh, you're getting an expert who knows all that kind of stuff for your code without having to hire an expert to do that. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is that you, if you don't want to have like a special use case or write your own stories, you could just use the, the boilerplate stories that we generate, which are still generated from your components and using your props yeah. or your inputs. So if you didn't have a niche use case, you could just not write any code at all, just generate and have it. Oh, and we also generate Cypress specs, of course. So in the Cypress specs, we point to the storybook iframe and then we make, and then we pass the arguments through the URL. So you don't even have to write it with tests, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny because like, I'm just thinking, wow, like it sounds like this is a really great developer experience, a top storybook, right? You know, storybook is fairly unopinionated, right? Where you can go and, you know, use different libraries, you d use different view libraries, you know, add different add-ons, all that kind of stuff. It tries to be, um, you know, whatever you need it to be. But what you've done is actually added some rails to this and kind of created this experience where it's like, hey, if you don't have any experience documenting your components in storybook like we do that for you we generate all of them for you so you can get like you can get a big head start just by using an x instead of doing it you're building it up on your own yeah and uh, the good thing is that when we create a new feature or or if there's a change in storybook like in a format or something uh, we, the NX team, talk with Michael Schillman, or I also talk a lot with Jan Braga, who are both, my, Michael is the, the Storybook founder, and Jan Braga is on the Storybook team, I guess. So, you know, we're in, in constant contact with the Storybook team, so we stay on top of, of these things. It's not like we go on our own and we do our own thing, you know. It's, it's a back and forth. And also, if something breaks in NX or if something breaks in Storybook, in some cases, I've put in an MR for Storybook to integrate better with an X or Colum, who, who works with me now on the Storybook integration. He also put in an MR uh, last month that solved a huge issue that we had 
he put it in a, a pull request in the storybook repository because something was mistyped and was causing some issues in an X. So it's sort of a back and forth thing, you know? I love that. I love that. Yeah. And it's, it, it's great too, because a lot of times, you know, with open source projects like this, it can be really hard to talk with everybody about every single feature. But with, with something like this, you know, you have a direct line with, with our team and, you know, have been able to collaborate. And then everybody who's using NX gets the benefit of that relationship and kind of knowing, you know, knowing that you're using the best practices because you've been able to kind of indirectly talk with the people who know exactly what's going to be coming next, like in the next version of storybook and all that kind of stuff to be able to plan accordingly. So it's, it's really cool. And I know that we've really valued the, um, kind of those communications and relationships and and whatnot. It's been great. <laughs> and the storybook repository uses an X, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very virtuous little cycle, very like a dog yeah. footing type of uh, <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, I'm curious, you know, just, I guess, to keep us honest, um, what are some things that you see that we could be able to improve in storybook um, to make that storybook and X integration even easier for folks? Let me think. So one thing we're trying now to do is to, you know how I talked about that we have a wrapper around the storybook builder. I, we are actually now trying and there's a pull request in and I'm trying to get people to test it. We have now pull request where uh, we remove the wrapper. And how is this possible? It's possible because uh, story, storybook uses an X and it uses in the storybook angular, uh, package. They, they actually use the, the format for, for generators for angular builders. Right. So okay. the angular package of storybook exposes builders in a format and in a syntax and packaged in a way that NX recognizes, which is angular builder. Right. So the good thing is that. Now, Angu Storybook Angular users, I hope when that pull request gets merged, will be able to directly use the Storybook Angular Builder and not use our wrapper cool. around it. I would hope that since now Storybook is using an X, potentially at some point in the distant future, and this is a huge thing to ask, I know, is to, <laughs> to try to expose the other builders for the other packages as well through our, like our executor syntax or the NX Deputy executor syntax yeah, yeah, yeah. to expose them like that. Because for example, uh, for the React builder or the view builder or the other frameworks builder, we cannot do that because they're not exposed as, uh, as builders. So we, we do, we still have to have the wrapper and make it a builder ourselves, for example. <laughs> but that would improve the, the developer experience of the NX developers, right? Um, as in terms of uh, improving the developer experience of uh, developers that use Storybook and NX, um, I'm not sure what could improve the integration. I think we're I think we're we're moving at it's at, at a good pace right now because we're we're working in parallel. Nice. Well, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been great. And I want to uh, just be respectful of your time. So first, thank you so much for being here. I learned a ton, actually. I think the way that you framed mono repos really helped me understand a lot of the benefits that we're, we're trying to capture and some of the misconceptions that we have around that. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Katarina, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, if people want to uh, follow you on Twitter or learn more about NX, where can they do that? So first, you can follow me on Twitter at CyberCity, at P-S-Y-B-E-R-C-I-T-Y. -Y. And or you can go at, uh, on our webpage, nx.dev. And there you will find all the docs and everything I talked about today about the mental model and the philosophy behind the next. And in there, if you scroll down, you will also find the storybook and next documentation in integration documentation, um, which I think is, uh, is pretty valuable and uh, 
Love it. Love it. Yeah. And we'll, um, I'll get all those links from you and we will include those in the uh, description below for people to click on. Uh, Katarina, again, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you and uh, all of the, the knowledge that you bring to um, our experiences. Uh, for everyone watching, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you for showing up and watching this. Uh, if you liked it, give us a like. Uh, and if you have questions or you just want to chat, you can throw something in, just in the description. Uh, and we really encourage you to join the Storybook Discord. There's a lot of awesome conversations happening there. Again, we'll include a link to the link in the description below for that. And uh, we will see you in the next one. Bye.